Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org, a website in English about Ukraine. Today we are going to talk about propaganda. What is Russian propaganda? Why it is so dangerous and how we can analyze it and whether it is responsible for what is going now for these atrocities uh, which we are experiencing during the Russian invasion of Ukraine. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org and I am joined by my colleague Vitaly Rybak, who is chief analyst of Ukraine world.org hello vitali hello thank you for having me thanks uh, vitalik for for this conversation so you are our major specialist in monitoring russian propaganda we will talk about it in detail we also want to share with you with our listeners and with our viewers that we are making Uh, a live uh, coverage of Russian propaganda on our website, ukraineworld.org. We are also making lots of videos explaining how Russians are dehumanizing Ukrainians, Europeans, Americans. Uh, but before we start, let me remind you that you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash ukraineworld. Uh, Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest and oldest uh, Ukrainian media NGO. Let's start, Vitaly. And uh, if you are asked, uh, probably, for example, to name three major features of Russian propaganda, what would you say? This is quite a complex issue because Russian propaganda has been developing its features for many years. But I would say that Russian propaganda is multilateral because it is often uh, different for different audiences. For instance, there are one narratives for Russia's domestic audience and very separate narratives for any uh, outside for any audiences outside of Russia. For Ukraine, there may be narratives about that, you know, the West is really bad for Ukraine. Uh, they're not saying that Russia is good, but West is really bad. It is trying to uh, to use Ukraine for its natural resources and so on. And, uh, well, basically Ukraine is only a colony of the West, something like that. Meanwhile, for the internal audience, Russia is putting this narrative in different light, having a different spin on it. It is saying that, you know, Ukraine has been enslaved, we have to free it from the Western rule, so we have to free Ukrainians who are currently being enslaved. So basically the same message, but shown very different for various audiences. Russian propaganda focuses on television quite a lot. Uh, we see Russia pouring a lot of finances, billi so billions, billions of rubles, and annually to support its state-owned television because there are still a lot of people in Russia who who use television as main source of getting news and frankly the only source of getting news. But we also see Russian propaganda using more modern channels <clears throat> such as uh, Telegram, Twitter, and so on, and they're using bots and trolls there, so Russian propaganda is not only oriented at traditional uh, mediums and using traditional uh, information sources, but also very modern ones, that's why it's quite dangerous. If I tell you that uh, the key strategy of Russian propaganda of of, uh, of the of the latest years or decades was not so much even to disinform but to dehumanize dehumanize Ukrainians, Europeans, Americans, uh, tell the Russian audience that, uh, for example, Ukrainians don't exist that they, or if they exist, they're just Nazis and killers and murderers, etc., or that Europe is uh, has been degrading and uh, going to the to its collapse and spreading inhumane ideology uh, like uh, for for russians inhumane like same-sex marriages or whatever else would you agree with that would you agree that the key point was an ease in this dehumanizing yeah i i totally agree with that i would even go further and i would say that russian invasion of ukraine Uh, which started on February 21st, would be impossible without propaganda, or at least at this scale at which we have seen it, because, well, actually, we see that a lot of Russian soldiers, captured soldiers, or those who post uh, videos on social networks and so on, so a lot of them really believed that they came to Ukraine to liberate Ukrainians, to fight against Nazis, to protect people in Donbass, and so on. So with some of these soldiers, these propaganda narratives really worked. Of course, uh, not with all of them, because some came to earn money or 
well, there there can be many reasons why maybe someone did not have any other choice. So there may be many reasons why Russian soldiers came here. So they supported this invasion of Ukraine, but believing in propaganda is one of the main reasons. Also, we see that Russian population mainly supports the invasion. So either by uh, being in favor of it or simply staying silent. We've seen some protests against the war, uh, which which was a good thing, of course, but still it was not enough. And these protests mainly took place in big cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, some other big Russian cities. But, you know, in regions, uh, we really did not see a lot of protests going on. And uh, in regions, more people generally watch TV and believe in Russian propaganda. When I refer to Russian sociology, we have to always keep in mind that there is no 100% reliable sociology in Russia. But still, those figures that we have, not from Russian uh, state-owned pollsters, but from independent pollsters like Levada Center, we still see that, uh, well, in some cases, more than 70% of Russians believe uh, that invasion of Ukraine was a good thing and they support Putin. This is also direct cause of propaganda. Uh, also, if we take a look at uh, what Russia has been doing in Donbas, the very same region it claims to liberate, we see destroyed cities, we see thousands of Ukrainian civilians killed, and we see, well, basically destroyed lives, because um, cities such as Mariupol, Volnovakha, Liman, and sadly dozens of others have been completely erased, and uh, even people who uh, had enough time to flee, now basically they have nowhere to come back to. The cities have to be completely rebuilt, and... Russia won't do that. It would follow. It would fall on Ukraine's shoulders back when Ukraine liberates these territories, and uh, well, Russian media do not say about anything like that. Even more, they try to accuse Ukrainians of destroying the cities. So they said that uh, well, Ukrainians used their own civilian population as shield to protect from Russian attack, that Ukrainians blew up some buildings, like for instance Russia is saying about this uh, theater in Mariupol where uh, hundreds of uh, Ukrainians were killed by Russian bombs dropped on this theater, so now Russian propaganda is saying no, it's Ukrainian, it were Ukrainian Nazis who blew uh, up this theater, so... Yeah, Russian propaganda helps to, uh, it basically supports Russian army on the ground, it helps to uh, to promote the idea of war uh, to Russian population and thus continue the war. Therefore, my opinion is that Russian propagandists are as responsible for deaths of Ukrainian citizens as those soldiers and military commanders who really killed them. Absolutely, they just shaped the the hearts and minds of Russians and uh, made them uh, hate Ukrainians, and and really uh, really believe that Ukrainians will see the their land and their territory, and there is a bunch of Nazis that should be just exterminated. And uh, our experience of traveling in the villages uh, which were occupied or uh, in which Russian soldiers entered and uh, people who talked to Russian soldiers uh, personally, it confirmed that many of them really believed in this propaganda. Many of them really were uh, searching Nazis and asking the village dwellers to show them where Nazis are or fascists are. And uh, they were really believing that uh, they came here to liberate the country and to to protect, I don't know, Russian speakers or whatever else. Let me uh, let me also ask ask you about the the recent trends. What's happening uh, just recently? Maybe what what kind of uh, new narratives Russia is is developing? Before we talk about this, 
uh, I will address our listeners uh, saying that those of you who are watching us on YouTube, you can also watch our explaining, brief explaining videos about different aspects of, of Russian propaganda. You can see these links in the description or right on the screen. Vitaly has drafted the, uh, the scripts for these videos and they're really explaining very diff different aspects of it. Uh, but coming back to the uh, current narratives, one of the uh, things that surprised me is how, uh, you know, we, we, we were all kind of surprised sometimes what, uh, what absurdities Russians are saying on the state TV, those propagandists like Kisilov or Solovyov. But recent video when Kisilov was saying, uh, was showing a video of an alleged Ukrainian soldier who was allegedly confessing that he was a, uh, a pederast, uh, uh, so the, the the image of this being a pederast, meaning that uh, he was appointed as a person to be uh, to be raped by U other Ukrainian soldiers. And when you're watching this video, you understand that it's total fake, and uh, it's it's a total insinuation because you cannot really imagine this this uh, man, which is a big fat man to to perform perform this role so we understand how how uh, inhumanely russians are fabricating the stories and they don't even care wh whether it looks uh true or not wh what is your perception does it really gone nuts in the recent months yeah so in my opinion there are not only inhumane but also sometimes lazy in producing their narratives because we've seen uh, several times during this last few months a very crude fakes produced by russians so for instance there was a fake published by ria novosti where uh, they were saying that russian forces in donbas captured a secret laptop of a Zo battalion where there were like information about which objects would be bombed in Donetsk. So they were saying that this is, look, this is a proof that Ukraine was going to attack Donetsk. Even a quick glance on this photo of this laptop shows that uh, Ukrainian language in this photo on this laptop was not used properly. So where a Ukrainian letter A so it was written with Russian letter A, not with Ukrainian one. And there were many, many other fakes like this, which could be like really easily debunked because uh, Russians did not care enough to make these look trustworthy. And well, but basically it continues, and I think that uh, Russian propaganda uh, bets not on the quality of uh, such fakes or disinformation, misinformation, but on the sheer volume of uh, fake information which is being put out. Because we've also seen that, for example, with the case of Bucha, where. Russian propaganda has been coming up with a lot of various ex possible explanations for what has been happening. Either Ukrainians did this or British and US intelligence did that, making a kind of information chaos so that readers would not know what to believe in and they would not believe the official versions which are uh, well, true that Russian army did that, so this, so that this would be only one of the options out there, and that has been Russian strategy for many years. As I also said before, in Ukraine, Russia has not been trying to promote itself, say that Russia is really good and worse having relations with, yes, of course, some politicians like Viktor Medvedchuk and his party opposition platform for life have been doing that, but others like Shari party, they were not. They were only criticizing the West and Ukraine's cooperation with the West. And well, that's why Russian propaganda is dangerous, because it's, it's so chaotic. It uh, does not create anything new. It only seeks to destroy what has already been there. Interestingly, uh, the, the topic which uh, which concerns um, many people in the world, the topic of food security, is also used by Russian propaganda. We have seen the reports. Uh, we know the situation, right? That uh, Russia is blocking the Black Sea. The Ukrainian ships cannot go from from their ports to export uh, 
to ex export grain. We have talked about it several times on our podcast, in our publications. What Russians are saying that, look, it's, it's all the fault of the West because Europe is uh, creating better conditions for exporting of Ukrainian grain through, through the land, uh, land corridors or through the railway. And therefore, Europe is responsible for a future famine in Ukraine. This is also an example how crazy uh, these uh, these narratives are so they take a situation when they are clearly culpable when they're clearly uh, criminal the russians are clearly criminal for the situation they're clearly responsible for that they started the war they captured ukrainian territories uh, including the agricultural territories they blocked the ukrainian agricultural experts and then they blamed the west for uh, increase of prices or for taking the food out of ukraine uh, at the same time, they are confiscating food and using the same language as uh, is, it was used by Stalinist regime in the 30s when they were confiscating the, uh, the Ukrainian grain and really provoking the famine. So uh, this is one of the examples how they really turn uh, things from the heads uh, on, 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 its, on its head. Do you have any other examples of probably the most notorious narratives of fakes which were circulating? Uh, recently there was also an interesting case where a lot of russian news websites were writing about health problems of joe biden and jens stoltenberg and so clearly in my opinion it was uh, well just their response to all the stories about putin's problems with health putin potentially having cancer so they were put mirroring this saying that well of course they were not mentioning any potential health problems with putin but they were saying that you know joe biden is very old and here's he's clearly not fit to be a president they were also doing this a lot regarding the war so whereas ukraine was saying that you know russia shoots civilians and uh, rapes women and girls so russians have been saying the same that you know ukrainian soldiers uh, are shooting civilians and and raping and pillaging we've seen uh, a lot of cases where russian propaganda has heard what uh, ukraine and the west has been saying about russia and then simply turning it around that saying that no you do this we do not and uh, so what you've been saying about grain and i would also add metal exports because there were a lot of supplies of metal in mariupol which russia is currently uh, transferring to russia itself and maybe will try to sell sometimes later so they were also saying that you know it's europe who's stealing grain from ukraine and europe wants to create artificial famine there was even such narrative that Poland created an artificial narrative in Ukraine in 1930s, which is clearly absurd, because how could Poland have done this if Ukraine has been a part of the Soviet Union back then? But but still, this, this is the level of narratives we have to deal with. You mentioned uh, Poland and another uh, widespread narrative that uh, you have tracked and we have tracked a few weeks ago was that the the russian propagandists are increasingly telling the story that poland is going to occupy the western ukraine so they are really waiting for polish troops to enter ukraine and to occupy it and they're saying that look uh, ukraine is hiring polish uh, polish citizens they put them on the on the may on the positions of mayors or uh, of the cities or the to the administrative positions in western ukraine and these people these polish citizens will prepare the future annexation of uh, the western ukraine by by poland and this is the narrative which is very powerful i hear it a lot of uh, not only in the russian uh, russian social networks but by some other people from other countries who are really expecting believing that there will be a partitioning of ukraine very soon if for example any western country enters to uh, to this uh, to this story that will of course legitimize the russian occupation because it was like with partition of poland in 18th century uh, where it was just divided between russia Pro prussia and uh, austria 
and then it will have the same situation now with Ukraine. So how do you explain it? How do you explain this narrative? As if uh, Russia was really also putting the uh, things on its head and uh, trying to present some other countries which are uh, to present other countries as occupiers and maybe to shift the attention of its own occupation of Ukraine. In my opinion, Russia is actually saying what it believes in, because we've seen on multiple examples that Russia only sees, sees international relations as realpolitik. Well, it does not believe in international cooperation. It sees international relations as the sum game. Therefore, Russians can't understand how the U.S., uh, NATO, Poland, other Ukraine's allies can be helping Ukraine without seeking uh, their own personal gain in return. That's why Russia is very sure, I, I'm also sure of this, that Russians believe, truly believe that NATO wants to strengthen its control over Ukraine and that's why it's helping. So Russia does not believe in some value-based approach such as protecting democracy, freedom and so on, which Western world does. And Russia sees this as a very simple concept. So, you know, only concept of greed, gain and personal uh, profit but not value-based approach so yeah that's why i believe this that's where i believe this narrative is coming from one of the other another narrative is the narrative of preventing uh, preventive war or defensive war we hear this narrative of course both from putin and lukashenko that they started this operation so-called operation only to prevent the west from attacking or ukraine from attacking donbass and uh, the phrases of lukashenko that uh, Ukrainians were preparing an attack and, and uh, Belarus, uh, the, the, the preventive strike was made from Belarusian territory, has become already a meme in Ukrainian social no networks. Everybody is laughing at that. But uh, it is still very valid for um, Russian and some Belarusian, I guess, citizens, especially for the Russian citizens, uh, on Russian state TV, we hear the narrative that look, it is it is uh, it is the war for Russian independence from the Western colonialism. It is the war in which there is a genocide of Russian population. They obviously meant both Russians and Ukrainians. So they try try to present this war as a defensive war. Uh, do you think that this is efficient for the Russian population and the Russian citizens do believe that this is a defensive war and not an aggression? Yeah, so I think this this is really working and this is also not surprising because we know from history that many uh, totalitarian and authoritarian regimes have been building their foundation upon this idea of an enemy which is standing at the borders and is ready to invade. So uh, basically for Putin, this is a good reason to explain why he is needed for Russia, because for years he's been creating an image of himself as, you know, such a Tsar of Russia who protects Russians from NATO, which is already at the border, which uh, which built its military bases near Ukraine uh, or even in Ukraine, which has uh, invited uh, Baltic states to join and NATO so is the enemy which is at the gates of Russia and only Putin can protect Russians from this enemy. We've seen such a military rhetoric for years also when uh, Putin was uh, Putin and his officials were presenting new Russian weapons such as uh, Salmat missile which in which can carry a, a nuclear payload and so on. So Russians uh, Russian propaganda have been has been saying for years that you know Russia has to protect itself because its enemies, be it Ukraine, the US, NATO or someone else, want to destroy Russia, so we Russians have to unite together. And we've seen this uh, narrative go even further since February 24th, because 
Putin is now even talking about, you know, national traitors, uh, traitors of the nation. He's referring uh, with this term to those Russians who did not support the war and left the country. So he said that, you know, we are purging our, ourselves, our country from such people who are ready co to cooperate with the enemy. And we've also seen for years that Russia has been labeling uh, independent media, NGOs, uh, also pollsters as these so-called foreign agents. Just one conclusion that uh, it appears that information space is not innocent at all, that it's really a tool for uh, preparing the, the real war. Uh, we were considering it as a weapon uh, before the these events, but not only it is a weapon, uh, but it is, it is, it is able to prepare the real weaponry, the real warfare, and uh, much of the blame for this invasion is on Russian propagandists that spent uh, years and maybe decades to dehumanize Ukrainians, to dehumanize Europeans, dehumanize Americans, the Western world, the democratic world, and to motivate Russians to die for nothing. Let me remind for those who are watching us on YouTube that you can watch our video explainers about the Russian propaganda. This was an Explaining Ukraine podcast by ukraineworld.org. We have talked about Russian propaganda and why it is dangerous, why it is responsible for this war. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine. I talked to Vitaly Rybak, who is the chief analyst of ukraineworld.org. Thank you, Vitaly. My name is Vladimir Yermolenko. I'm chief editor of ukraineworld.org. Uh, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash ukraineworld. Uh, a big amount of this support actually we're, we're giving to help people affected by the war and help Ukrainian resistance. So we actually distribute your donations farther to the country which, which, uh, for people which really need it. Follow us on, on social networks, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.